Sopak's eyes slowly opened. At first, he thought he was back in his father's house in Camp Dimtorch. That was not so, however. The room was a strange one, with pelts hanging from the walls and furniture made from antlers and bone. Sopak was laying naked in a tub of warm water, which he only knew by looking, for he had lost feeling in most of his body. "'Ah, you're awake,' someone said. "'How are you feeling?' Sopak found it difficult to move his jaw to answer. Sleepy, he said. "'It's numb. Where am I?' "'You're in my home,' said a dark-skinned human who had moved into his view. "'I'm Ikumak, and you are?' Sopak. "'You're not from around here, are you, Sopak?' "'No, sir.' You were frozen solid when you were brought here. I was afraid you wouldn't make it, but after nearly an hour of trying, I was able to start your heart beating again. What were you doing out there in that terrible cold? Thank you, sir. I was trying to find out whether snowmen are real. Ikubak laughed aloud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, he said after a moment. It's just a tremendous irony. You see, it was a snowman that brought you here. But how is it even possible? They're made of snow. They're just water. So is an aqua horse, said Ikamak, but they're very much alive. So are lava slugs, which are only melted stone. Have you ever seen one? No, but I've seen the snowmen. They're compassionate creatures and often rescue humans who have been stranded in the snow. Goblins too, apparently. If you need proof, take a look at the floor. Sopak struggled to sit up straight and look where Ikumak had indicated. There was a huge puddle soaking through the floorboards. Snowman droppings, Ikumak explained. They're compassionate, but not housebroken. Sopak craned forward and saw a shiny stone on the floor. Is that quartz? he asked. What? That? I think it is. They sometimes eat quartz by mistake because it looks so much like ice. I know someone who would be very interested in that. You can have it if you want. I don't know why anyone would. Seems a bit like having a beaded mustard to me. Sopak looked out the window at where the snow was still blowing. I need to get home, he said. My father will be worried about me. You're not going anywhere, said the human. You've been dead most of the day. You wouldn't make it a mile in your condition. And with the way this weather is tonight, you'd be frozen again in ten minutes. You're staying here and regaining your strength. Sopak sank back into the tub. The big solstice celebration was in two days, and his father would spend it not knowing if he was alive or dead. Feather envied her dwarven friends this morning. The long, pointy ears with which goblins were blessed were wonderful for hearing, but on days like this they were the first things to get unbearably cold. She hadn't been able to find her hat before she left the house, and really wasn't willing to go all the way to Singing Pony to do her solstice shopping without it. Perhaps she had left it at work. Splim's was closed today. Ostensibly, it was to give Splim time off to prepare for tomorrow. In reality, it was because there was nothing to serve. The waitress let herself into the darkened restaurant. Surely enough, there was her hat on a peg near the door. Placing it on her head and making sure it was snug against sudden winds, she smiled to herself and made to leave, when she was stopped by a sound. It seemed as if someone was crying. Feather looked around, but could see no one. Cautiously, she moved toward the kitchen. There she found Splim sitting on the floor, sobbing in a most ungoblinly way. She had never seen him like this before, and it was disconcerting to say the least. Splim, she said as she moved to his side. Are you all right? There's nothing left, cried Splim. It's supposed to make a feast for tomorrow, 
and there's no food. I don't know what to do. Feather didn't say anything for a while. Then she asked, Do you believe in Vertarbna? I guess so. It's not like I'm one of his followers or anything. Well, I am. And I've learned that Vertarbna always provides. I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to get everything ready. You're going to stoke the ovens. You're going to set the tables. You're going to set the kettles to boiling. And then you're going to wait for a miracle. That's crazy talk, Feather, chided the cook without conviction. You have a better idea? No. Fine. I'll do things your way. But don't ask me to expect a miracle. That's okay, boss. You just get everything ready. I'll do the believing for both of us. Five miles south, Point shivered in the cold as he knocked on Uruk's door. It was a very long, very cold walk out here to Ponytown. The sooner a train stop was put in here, the better, thought the Cyclops. Uruk opened the door and gave him a warm welcome. Sorry it took me so long to answer the door, said the Luton. It's just now dawn and I was a sloth when you first knocked. Thank you. Is Mara here? She's out back, replied Uruk. I'll get her for you. He started toward the back door when Mara entered from outside, Algene beside her. Good morning, Point, said the seer. Mara was just showing me this amazing igloo which Mintaka built for the ponies. Quite an amazing thing. I rushed here as soon as I got your message. I knew it was urgent, but I tried not to look ahead and find out what the matter was, of politeness and all that. Point smiled at his fellow Cyclops, though the look in his eye remained grim. I have a special favor to ask both of you, he said. Mara, if Algene can locate Sopak with his special sight, could you teleport us to his location? I can teleport anywhere in the world if I know where I'm going, said Mara, but I've never been to Loskai. I wouldn't have any frame of reference. And it's not like Algene can show someone else what he sees. What if you had a map? asked Point. That would help. I could take you to the general area, at least. But then we'd be out there in the snow with no way to get to where Sopak is. I know what to do, said Uruk. Wait here. He dashed out the back door and came back moments later with his daughter Rose. My daughter is a nightmare, he said indicating the equine's telltale bat wings. She's telepathic. Rose, can you allow your mother to see what Algene is seeing? Sure, that's easy. Algene closed his eye and cast his mystic vision northward. It appeared to he and Mara as if they were flying at very high speed. Northward they went, zooming in on the spot where Sopak had collapsed. Tracks, Mara pointed out. I see them. Those aren't goblin tracks. Let me back up. The snow in the scene slowed, stopped, and began falling back up into the sky. After a while, a large white figure appeared, walking backwards. In his arms, a small green boy. The scene stopped and spun so that they could better see his face. It was indeed Sopak. His lips, nose, and ear tips were blue. Running the scene forward, Algene followed the snowman to a small cabin far outside the southern edge of Loskai. Looking within, the seer and the unicorn watched as a human man worked to revive the boy. Coming up to the present, they saw Sopak laying in a tub of water, softly crying as feeling began to return to his body. He's alive, said Mara. I can go there whenever you're ready. How many of us can you take with you? I can take three or four people with me without help. We'll need to leave room for Sopak to come back with us, said Algene. Myra kissed her husband goodbye. I won't be able to come back for a full day, she said. Go on, said Uruk. This is important. I'll hold down the fort here. Whoever is coming, put your hands on my back, Mara said. The unicorn concentrated, and in a flash was gone, the two cyclopses with her. 
In less than a second, the three of them were standing outside Ikumak's cabin. After a quick knock on the door, they were led in and greeted warmly by both Ikumak and Sopak, who was tremendously relieved to see them. May I have my clothes, please, said Sopak, standing up with difficulty. I'm going home now. No, you're not, said Mara. I can only teleport once per day. I'm afraid we'll have to wait here until my power is rested. You are certainly welcome, said Ikumak. It is rare that I get visitors who aren't out to rob me ever since the Lam Shiyun took over. Point helped Sopak to put his clothes on, since the boy's fingers were not working properly, and sat next to him on Ikumak's sofa, giving him occasional sips of hot tea, which the human graciously prepared. Algene settled himself in a comfy-looking chair and snuggled down in a stack of blankets. It was going to be a long wait.